This is Bookmarks with Richard Gads. Hello, I'm Richard Gads. Uh, I'm uh, sitting, having a cup of tea in my kitchen in Canesham uh, today with Tom Carlyle, whose debut novel, Blight, has been out, uh, what, about four months now? Something that like that. That sounds about right to me. That sounds about right. Um, so, uh, thank you for coming along, Tom. Tell us all about the book. Okay, so Blight is uh, it's a gothic horror novel, although that might be slightly overselling it. Uh, it's about um, a young man who returns to the home that he fled uh, about a decade before um, when he finds out that his father is ailing. Uh, and when he comes home, uh, he's forced to confront some of those things that forced him to flee in the first place. Um, so not just the kind of tortured web uh, of his kind of family legacy uh, and his place in that, um, but also uh, this kind of ancient entity that's been living below his village, uh, demanding kind of child sacrifice um, and effectively warping the world around him. And that's where the blight of the title comes from, mm-hmm. uh, that sense of there being something in the soil that's corrupting, uh, that's poisoning uh, every part of that legacy, um, every part of that bit of the world. Yeah, it sounds very Lovecraftian. I mean, so I have to say, I, I have never made it through much Lovecraft, and that's partly yeah. because I'm not great with short stories. So what I know of Lovecraft. Like, I love the style and I love the concepts, but, but personally, my experience of Lovecraft is very limited. Yeah. He does. I, I always find with Lovecraft, there's a, although he writes in a very similar style all the way through, the actual stories themselves are very different. Mm. You know, there are some that seem quite domestic and there are others that are on a very grand sort of a, you know, cosmic scale. But uh, yes, it's interesting. What sort of what sort of themes do you want to uh, uh, are are in the book? What kind of uh, uh, sort of subtext is there? Well, so like I think a lot of the book is it comes from this like strangely theological place. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think I really realised <laughs> that until until it was finished. Just how theological it became. So there's this trend throughout um, throughout Christianity uh, of, of the kind of innate sinfulness of humanity mm. um, and the need to be set free by some sort of sacrifice. Um, and so you see that in the story of Christ. And there have been horror writers throughout, the, like particularly throughout the Gothic period, that have played off that. So some of the earliest ones, the Castle of Otranto, the Monk, um, especially Dracula, mm. have got these kind of subversions of that Christian image. So the vampire being a kind of subversion of Christ, saying you need to drink of my blood, uh, drink of my blood, eat of my flesh, and then you'll be transformed. You'll live forever. Yeah. Um, and I think what I was interested with is that that sense of sacrifice but a a corrupted sacrifice Mm. um or perhaps even that sense that 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 christian tradition when when warped and twisted can become something really monstrous it can Mm. become it can become something that devours your whole life and so you've got a young man here who is expected to submit to some sort of set of rituals which is going to which is going to destroy him but he's told that if he doesn't do something about this, if he doesn't act upon it, mm. then then the fate of the world is at stake. Um, and I think once you get that idea inside of your head, you can see how that warps your whole life out of shape and also how that, war- that warps a whole community mm. out of shape. And I don't know, I mean, some of this has come from personal experience. So I, you know, I grew up a Christian um, and I think I've spent the past 15 years unpicking some of what that's done to me as a teenager. So, you know, I think there's still some, some faith in there, but it's very different from that quite intense faith I had when I was 15 or 16. Mm. I think some of that has come from seeing the way faith has been played out, in, particularly in America at the moment, how those ideas have, have warped a whole society out of, out of shape. Yeah. And, and how you can take something like this that's supposed to be quite admirable and quite sacrificial and turn it, some, turn it into something that becomes quite monstrous and quite mm. corrupt. Does quite that aggressive, sense? yeah. I, yeah. Uh, I know what you mean. And I think it comes from terror as well. So one of the things that yeah. I thought about um, a lot, so 
there's a couple of things I, I would point to in terms of the writing of this. Um, mm. uh, Howard David Ingham wrote a great book called We Don't Go Back, which is basically a chronicle of folk horror. Yeah. So um, it, I think it's, it's mostly centred around cinema, but he picks up on some of the, the trends of folk horror. Um, and particularly, one thing that he, he references is Robert Eggers' film The Witch. Mm. So you've got this New England society, this devout group of, mm. uh, of Christians who've gone out there to, to be as pure as possible, mm. um, that find themselves exiled from their community for not fitting in. And then they're on the edge of the woods, and there's, there's something that comes out of the woods, and it snatches this child, and then, like, just all hell breaks loose. And some of that comes from the terror of the woods, the terror of the unknown, something yeah, out there. Yeah. But some of that comes from that self-sustaining terror, that yeah. sense that you create this, like you are afraid of the world, yeah. you're in your little pure enclave here, and then something comes in and, and you respond with aggression. Mm, that is a fabulous film. It's so good, isn't it? It's, blooming. it's one of those... I really love that film, particularly because it's subtle. Mm. You know, it, it's really scary but it's really scary because of what you don't see mm. and that's that's a subtlety that um you don't see too much these days yeah i completely agree yeah and it, and it's full of nightmarish images that oh, don't yeah. come in jump scares but when you you close your eyes you can still see them yeah. i'm sure anyone who's seen that oh yes knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but i mean this i mean there's no blood and gore or, or anything like that mm. but it's just so conceptually Terrifying. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> uh, and the way they speak, apparently all that dialogue was authentic. Yeah, um, I heard this as well. Exactly, because I, I, I can't quite remember where they, they got it all from, but they got it actually, every word that's spoken. I think there's, there's spoken, kind of court yeah. transcripts or maybe like village records. Yeah, like that. yeah, it was something like that. But. And I, I mean, I love that idea as, as something you can do in, particularly in fiction and literary fiction. But I have to confess... <laughs> I, like, the amount of time it takes to do that is huge. Like, mm. there's a part of me that would, would so desperately love to dig into the records and do what Robert Eggers has done there, to find some of those historical pieces and think, I'm going to turn a real story from this. Yeah. Uh, and then time has been against me. And so there was, there was one incredible story I heard about recently. And I'm sorry, I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent here, um, but I thought there's a novel in this yeah. um, about there was a uh, a man in America. He wanted to send this ship off to basically be like a prayer ship. So it was going to circle the globe um, and they would be perpetually praying for all the nations to bring about the redemption of the world. So yeah. it's kind of a missionary ship. Yeah. Um, and essentially what happened was about eight months after setting out, I think eight months after setting out, they came back and, and almost all the people on the ship had starved to death. So he... He had mistreated them to such an extent and abused them to such an extent that he was eventually arrested um, and the, the, there was the complete, the complete ruin of this project. But I think that the story there about how people were brought into that, how, how that ideology curdled when they were out at sea and facing disaster, I think is, yeah. is fascinating. I find it very interesting to... And again, I, I feel at some point I've got to write about this... Mm. But about, you know, a sort of terrible dystopias which people have chosen. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I mean, say, like 1984, the, the whole political situation is imposed mm. upon people and they don't like it and all that, and you can see that. But then you take something like Brave New World and every character in that is very happy mm. in this horrible dystopia. And that's the sort of thing I find really fascinating and the challenge for me with that is, is working out where you start. So, you know, mm. I think of um, Tristan Shandy, and where Lawrence Stern over and over again tries to work out where to start telling his story. Does he start at the moment of birth? Does he start at this moment of, like, where a particular idea is embedded? Um, and he, he becomes this kind of self-deconstructing text. Mm. And so you're trying to tell the story of a revolution or those dystopias that people have chosen. And you think, I want to tell the whole story of this. Yeah. But... I also need to start with, with one person. Yeah. And yeah. then you think, but there are so many different angles on this. So how do you narrow it down to, to the one person, or the right person who's representative enough? Yeah. Um, and it, it, it's an overwhelming challenge. Yeah. It is. I mean, it always boils down to the single discontented person. Mm. You know, doesn't it? Whether, whether you get 
um, you know, a background in which everybody's happy or a background in which everybody's miserable. Sure. You have this one discontented person at, in, in, the, in the heart of the narrative, and from them, you know, everything yeah, kind of branches out. weaves out, you know. But, I mean, Blight itself is, is set in the 19th century. Mm. So what, what particularly drew you to that period? Did you do a lot of research and, and choose the period, or did the story kind of um, evolve as something that needed to be in the 19th century? Well, so I've always been fascinated by, particularly the end of the Victorian era, mm. as this time where you, the world is, is undergoing this huge process of change. So you go from a predominantly rural... This is a massive oversimplification of how I say it. But you go from a, a more rural way of things mm. to a much more industrialised, urbanised way of things. So you yeah. see mass movement into the city, you see the birth of factories, you see um, the kind of pioneering work of people like Isabel King de Brunel um, and Henry Ford over in America, like creating this mechanised world that you've got now. Mm. And so it seems to me like quite a fertile ground for, for kind of pre-made tension. And especially the sort of pre-made tension that I'm interested in with that kind of folk horror world. Mm. You know, the, you may be in the city, you may be living more comfortably or living living by the world of the machine. But then when you look out there, there are there the woods and the darkness hasn't gone away. Yeah. Um, and I would say I've always had that enthusiasm for particularly, like, particularly Dickens and about how Dickens embraces that darkness so whenever you're walking around in civilization in Dickens, you're only a short step away from incredible darkness. So there's a bit in Oliver Twist when he's walking in the market and then suddenly some Fagin's goons come out and Oliver's kind of dragged away into this nightmarish back street. Um, or in Bleak House, you know, you've got the, the houses of the rich, but then down there you've got the crossing sweeper um, and you've got these kind of charnel grounds, which are like they're, they're roughly kind of next to the rich and poor. Um, and to me, that dramatises it so effectively, that sense of the, the darkness is still there, you're just trying to ignore it. Um, and I think that was what inspired me a bit with, with Blight, is trying to capture that same nightmarish sense in Dickens, that yeah. sense that wherever you go, there, there is something nightmarish just waiting around the corner. Yeah. And, you know, you've lived your life in this place where you think I can I can get on and I just do what I need to do but if you actually look at it you see this kind of roiling darkness just under the surface yeah I always think that kind of um, process of urbanization is one of the things that helped the development of horror fiction mm. and speculative fiction um, because of that um, you know that sense of alienation People were moved from a situation in which um, they lived somewhere where they knew everybody and everybody knew them mm -hmm. uh, and then moved into a situation where they, they were surrounded by people who they'd never met, didn't know. Of course. And the reverse was true. You know, they, they had no connection with other people and the other people had no connection yeah, with them. That and that, sense. that must have uh, made a kind of... That and, you know, the kind of psychic... Uh, societal mm. shock that you got with things like Darwin. Uh, I don't think it's it's over coincidental that horror fiction emerges at that time um, a, as we know it today. I mean, there was always stories of ghosts and this mm. and the other, but they were always um, they were always meant to teach you something. You either had ghosts and monsters and things as a little element in a much bigger story, sure. you know, the Odyssey and all that mm. kind, of, or the, the stories were there to teach you some sort of moral lesson. Yeah. You know what I mean? After Dickens, and after Christmas Carol, and when you get through to, you know, like Dracula, mm. and uh, The Beetle by Richard Marsh, and all these kind yeah. of things, um, that, I think, expresses the kind of underlying... The, or the success of that, kind, of that thing then underlies the psychological changes, I think, that no, take place really in society, as well as the, all the economic... Uh, pressures that were, you know, and so is it that sense of inexplicability, that sense that you can't yeah. fully understand things? Exactly, you've lost, kind of lost track of the world. You mm. can't. It's um, that thing about, you know, uh, you can't possibly know more than whatever it is, some tiny percentage of human knowledge. Of course, um, 
And that wasn't true, sort of, beginning of the 19th century. Any one person could pretty well master everything that was known. Mm. And that became... And I think the, the late Victorian period is where that stopped being true. You know, where you had to start... You know, that interconnectedness of society really started, you know, part mm. of the urbanisation and the changes in this and the other and the economy. And now, I really like that as a thesis, and I really like that um, as a way of explaining why people become quite compartmentalised and quite individual, mm. and also as a lead-in to, to modernism, and so mm. a lead-in to that kind of fragmentation, that yeah. sense that things yeah. don't work anymore, so you need a new form to fit the chaos. Yeah. I always think there's so many parallels between the late Victorian period and now. Mm. There are so many parallels between um, everyday life in Victorian England and everyday life now. It's just sort of on a slightly different scale. I thought of that, but you're right. I mean, it doesn't make perfect sense. Yeah. And it, one of the things I, I've noticed in in recent fiction, well, I, I say recent, it's certain bits of recent fiction, mm. um, is that interest in trying to portray what the modern world has done to the mind. Mm. So... Uh, I'm reading Yon Foss at the moment, which I don't feel like I can recommend to too many people because it's one of these ones that's written in one long sentence without any full stops. Oh, um, like Lucy Elman's, <laughs> um, Lucy Elman's book, Doc's New Report, which also did the same thing. Yeah. And I, I'm also reading Carla Renausgaard at the same time, who does this kind of like intense autofiction, which is just right about everything. But I, I do think that these things are a reflection of trying to describe what the modern world has done to our minds. Yeah. It, it's trying to put consciousness on a page and say, yeah. look, this is what it's like to live now, and this is how overwhelming it is. So when Doc's new yeah. report, the narrator's always being pulled away. So she, she'll be focusing on something, and then suddenly she's thinking about what's the recipe for apple tart, yeah. or what am I hearing the news, <laughs> yeah. so a headline will flash across. Or Carl Every Nice Guy will be thinking about you know, some great philosophical idea and then forget, realise he's forgotten to plan meat for date night. So yeah. So, <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, I can I can see that and that sense of overwhelm. Yeah, I think I mean that's one of the the difficulties of history, really. That mm. it's so difficult to think yourself into the kind of mindset that people at the time would have had. Mm, yeah. I do agree. But uh... but you know I find that difficult as somebody who because uh, obviously um, the Burn Street haunting takes place in it's the seventies uh, yeah it's nineteen seventy three um, and so you you're away from phones and you've still got some yeah. kind of darkness I, I think the difficulty of trying to write a modern horror novel which is what I'm trying to do at the moment is what, what do you do about the, the phones question well don't, don't you think that uh, I mean I, I've lost count of the number of horror movies I've seen uh, uh, contemporary ones. The first thing they have to do is get rid of everybody's phone, mm. and uh, I think it, it, <laughs> it's becoming a cliche. Happens, you know, all the time. You know, the first thing that happens is, oh no, I've got no battery left, mm. or oh dear, I've trod on my phone, and that sort of thing. Oh no, the monster's eaten my. When phone. you when you think about it, it does happen a lot. You know, you, oh, you almost yeah. zone it out a bit, but it, it, it's a pretty regular feature now, isn't it? Well, it, it has to be because it, you know it's the one thing that you, it, that you have to say. Well, well just phone for help. Mm. You know, it's. <laughs> <laughs> and, start, and you've got to get rid of that. I was, it's going to be really hard, I think, to write contemporary crime stories mm. in about 30 years. Because we're already at the point where, you know, the slightest bit of DNA evidence at the scene of a crime can point to who did it. Give it another 30 years or something. You know, you, you'll have some handheld thing... You can walk into a crime scene, beep, beep, beep. Oh, right, that's uh, that's so and so's DNA. Go and arrest him, will you? You're and, right. And it's I think crime fiction uh, is going to get so boring because you know unless they find of, a new way. You well, know. Uh, unless criminals find this this fabulous new way of avoiding detection. But because uh, it, it might be data overload that does it, if you think about wow. it, if you think about how much information you've now got, like you yeah. might you might see a new wave of bureaucratic crime fiction. Yeah, that's a thought. Yes, yeah, so you've got you've got some pen pusher in the, in the police. Station. I say this as a pen pusher, <laughs> but I think that's why you get you see so much crime fiction these days is set in the past. That does make sense. You though. know, nearly all cosy crime is either set. Some quite some time in the past, or it's set in some sort of slight other world, some mm. rural yeah. setting where you know everything is quite old fashioned and 1950s. 
But I think that's going to become a real problem um, over time mm. because crime detection I reckon, is, going, is going to get to the point where you, you know, it, a combination of surveillance and AI and DNA and, and all these things. You put all of these things together and it's going to be almost impossible to just walk around in the world and not be traced somehow, no, I in some saying. way, you know? And uh, that does make it interesting for me from a publishing standpoint as well, because mm. publishers have got two choices to me. Like, they can either choose to, to lean into the kind of new forms and think we're going to do something new, or they can choose to double down on what works already and give people comfort for you. So if you think of Richard, Richard Osman's extremely successful, the Bullet the Mist and whatever the first the Thursday Murder Club ones, mm. they are, they're popular because they give people what they want. Um, and there's a lot of kind of imitators that have come up like that, like that, mm. that, that don't try and do anything new, that just do an extremely good, a good job of doing what works. Yeah. And I wonder where you find some of those more interesting, more novel approaches, you know, things that, that look like new crime novels or that, mm. that get around that question in, in interesting ways rather than just fudging it a little bit. Yeah. I think in I, the mid-list. Yeah, I, I need to be a bit more up on modern crime fiction. I don't read much of it. You know? <laughs> well, nor <laughs> so, me, to be honest. I, you know, Sherlock Holmes, yes, Agatha Christie, tick. Mm. But after that, as I say, the, you know, the, the sort of police procedural type thing kind of leads well, me there's been a few things it. recently so I'm trying to think of um, so Eliza Clark wrote a book recently called Penance and Joseph Knox wrote a book recently called True Crime Story and both of what mm. these are is they're slightly meta crime novels so they yeah. tell a story about an investigation but then somewhere through that investigation there'll, there'll be a counter narrative brought in mm. so you'll have somebody who's, who's putting together a podcast or putting together um, a dossier mm. and then there will be some, some alternative information that comes in and you'll be forced to, to reconcile that yourself so you're left with these questions thinking mm. this is beyond the text I've got, to, I've got to decide a bit like the turn of the screw with horror fiction mm. Um, and that, that seems to be working quite well. And Matt, I, I don't know if you read um, Matt Wesolowski. Matt Wesolowski wrote a fantastic series of books called Six Stories. Um, mm. I think they're published by Orion. And essentially what they are is they're, they're this fictional podcast where he's a crime reporter looking into a true crime thing. But there is some sort of supernatural element in there. So gradually, as he interviews the six people throughout this, a story unfolds itself. Right. But there's often a story that's that's got some supernatural ambiguity about it. So they're they're slightly horrorish and mm. they're they're slightly crime novelish, and they they are gripping. Like I I don't I don't love reading series because once you're trapped into that, you have to read that series forever. Yeah, you feel kind of obliged. You do. <laughs> but every one of these has been so different and so distinct and so gripping that mm. I like I would recommend them unreservedly. They're often quite cheap as well. They're well worth they're well worth reading those. All right, you heard it here first, folks. So is is that the kind of genre that um, you like reading in particular? No, to be honest, I don't, know, I don't know how I ended up writing horror fiction because the main thing I read is literary fiction. So yeah. everything by my bed is this kind of stack of literary fiction novels. Yeah. Um, so I I love Stephen King and I I love those classic era of horror novels mm. because there is a real like visceral. A real like visceral sense of emotion to them. I think what Stephen King does particularly well is he do, he does evoke emotions in you. He can evoke fear. He can evoke nostalgia. Like he's, yeah. he's really good at that in a kind yeah. of slightly Spielberg esque way. And and I like those as kind of my my relaxing escapist things. Yeah. But for the most part, what I tend to gravitate towards now is fiction that makes me think about the world or that makes me that, that presents the world in a different way so you yeah. know I read um, Olga Tokarczuk's uh, Drive Your Plough Over the Bones of the Dead recently uh, which is about this old woman living out in the Polish forest and it's about vegetarianism and what it means to be mad um, and so she's really into astrology um, and she uh, navigates the world through people's horoscopes and so yeah. she's this oddball character living out there and it's about how she sees the world through those through those eyes or what else have I been reading recently? Oh, I 
pick up with the mantis can't even know I, I'm reading Paul Murray's The Beast Thing at the moment which is oh, one of the, yeah. the big books of that's, that that's on my to read list it's it? phenomenal I mean yeah. Paul Murray is so great Skippy yeah. Dies um, I read last year and it's it's honestly one of the best comic novels I've read in the last decade he's so good at writing comedy yeah. but also comedy with an edge yeah. and I think The Beast Thing is a fascinating novel from the halfway I am through it yeah. because it's all about what ifs it's a novel all about regrets about how differently things could have gone if yeah. I'd if I'd just made that decision or I'd just made that decision but also the folly of that because yeah. you can never get to the start where was the first mistake you know was the first mistake yeah. here yeah. or was it further back was the first mistake that I was born was the first mistake that we ever started doing x y and z yeah. um or that we came down from the trees not that we came down from the trees says. exactly yeah. <laughs> Um, no, it's great. I like. I, I will extol the virtues of Paul Murray to anybody because I think everybody should read him. He's very, very good. Right. I always feel that, that comedy and horror work in very, very similar mm. ways. And they use the same kind of tricks and that sort of yeah. thing. Um, I could go off on a huge tangent of that, so I won't. Uh, I won't way. do it right now. But yeah, they. Uh, I think they. You know, the 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 inner mechanisms of both are very, very similar. Mm. But. Uh, hey. So what brought you to, um, to writing in the first place? That's a really good question. So I think like a lot, like a lot of writers, I was bullied at school. I think like a lot <laughs> yeah, of writers, there, yeah. I felt not very well like, understood at school. And so the beauty of writing, as I'm sure you can empathise, is that it gives you some time to come up with what you actually want to say. Yes, if you feel yes. misunderstood, you can, you can kind of finesse it a bit, can't you? Yes. And also it gives you a bit of escapism, so you think, okay, I can, I can get away from this world, I can come up with something different, or, you know, like some, some wish fulfilment. And so that was what I did as a, as a teenager, I wrote books, well, I didn't write books, but I wrote short stories throughout my teens, mm. and then went away to university and kind of scratched away at a novel while I was there, and nothing ever came of it. I wrote about 25,000 words and stopped at the stopping point, which is as far as anybody ever really gets. Yeah, I, I did that two or three times. Yeah. Like it's hard, isn't it? And then you hear about Zadie Smith, who just, like, banged their white teeth while she was at Oxford. <laughs> and the art was synced. Um, Jealous? Moi? <laughs> and then I kind of put it to one side, and I wrote blogs for a while, and then went to a university reunion and I sat next to a bunch of people who were all doing really amazing creative things. So there was somebody who was directing plays in London um, and there was somebody else who was, who was um, finishing up her first novel at the University of East Anglia on their creative writing course. And there was somebody else over here who was like a documentarian. And I thought, I don't do any of that anymore. Like I, I, ne- I always used to enjoy that. And I, now I just spend my whole life teaching and that's mm. that's everything I do I, I miss having something for myself so I went away from that and I thought I'm going to write a novel and it's going to be purely for me I'm just going to do it for the fun of it and so I did it I sat down every night after work and I wrote for about 50 minutes and it was great I mean it, it felt like it was it was for me again it was not a great mm. novel in terms of structure it was you know woolly as they always are but it it was finished, and when it was finished, I thought, I'm, I'm proud of this, this is yeah, good. Yeah. And then I wrote another one, and that was slightly better, and I thought, okay, maybe maybe I can learn this craft a bit, and you know, maybe this can be what I do when I'm not working. And then after that, I tried to write another one, which was a disaster, and then did a creative writing course the year my daughter was born, thinking this is a time to do both. And this will be something I do maybe for the rest of my life. Yeah. And now it's what I do with any spare time <laughs> I have outside of work, which is a yeah. blessing and a curse. And I would say this to anybody listening who wants to become a writer. It is, it is a full-on job. So if you're going to do it on top of another job, just, just know what you're getting yourself into and know what the trade-offs are. You know, yeah. know how much less exercise it will mean and how much <laughs> less time with your partner and how much less time playing computer games. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you say about, you know, um, making two or three attempts. That sort of thing. I always think a really good training for, for writers is to write in genres that they're not comfortable with. Mm. I mean, quite often, I mean, years ago when I was writing in the children's market, you know, quite often you get a commission for something that you would never have thought in a million years sure. that I kind of want to write. But the fact that you had to go and do it was actually... It's stretching, was, isn't it? Well, it was good experience hmm. because it forces you to 
you know, uh, think in a slightly different way. Mm. And I think I, I don't think I could be where I am today without having done all that sort of other stuff. That makes sense. But it, uh, you know, contributed to. Um, I, it sort of hones, as it were, what you know you can do, what you want to do mm. as a writer, and you know what where your strengths are. Yeah, and it I, totally resonates. It, it does take quite a long time I think I mean I really admire those writers who you know could sit down on day one I want to write this mm. full stop and out it comes and boom that's brilliant I but mean, they're the exception not the rule oh yes, yes the rest of us we just yes. muddle our way there and as you say you finally like you, you eventually yeah. refine it maybe after 30 years well quite yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> alright so what are you working on now well so I am working on my second book which is Touch Woods due out by October of this year, which mm-hmm. is about this is about this remote cult up in the Scottish Highlands. Um, it's about a young man who goes up there to try and find I say a young man, reasonably young man, mid twenties man who goes up there to try and find out um, how his brother died, uh, and when he goes up there, he discovers some enormous bloody mutation um, that's causing people to erupt in all kinds of unpleasant ways. Uh, so it's it's a love letter to eighties horror movies. Uh, right. It's you know got a bit of the invasion of the body snatchers and it's got a bit yeah. of the thing and it's got uh, what else has it got? I mean it's got a bit a bit of kind of cults in there as well. Yeah. Um, I could I could talk to you for another ten minutes about that, but I'm conscious we're at time. I think it it will be fun. That, well, that sounds terrific. I can't wait to read it. A sort of a tribute to eighties horror. That's uh, I'm first in line. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, some of my favourites, like you know, um, like you say, the thing and mm-hmm. Reanimator. And... Do you know, I've never seen Reanimator. Have you never seen? I really need to do that. <gasps> it's brilliant. Yeah. It's brilliant because it's horrible and it's very funny. I mean, that's part of the joy of the eighties, isn't it? Oh, they yeah. really leaned into that. Yeah, I think they they got it spot on with Return of the Living Dead. Mm. Uh, that that to me is like yeah, the perfect the horror comedy. Yeah, I, t- I, I could, totally I could watch that for It's wonderful. It's so yucky. And, uh, and so funny but anyway um, Tom Carlyle thank you very much indeed for talking to us today and uh, we'll see you next time that was Bookmarks with Richard Gads for more visit www.richardgads.co.uk